Hi everyone, number one Marmaduke fan here. I just watched a Diversity in Comics video roasting a recent Mags Visagio comic, and it reminded me of a thought experiment I've been thinking about for a while. And uh, I'm, not, I'm sure this idea isn't original to me. I'm sure other people have talked about this, but I've never seen someone talk about this idea in the way that I think about it. So I think it's worth doing a video on and I call it the coming SJW collapse. And the thing is, uh, when you try to predict the future, like look into your crystal ball based on how smart you are or what the polls say, the problem is that anything could go wrong. A million things could go wrong to make this prediction not come true. But I think the value of this thought experiment is if we kind of put ourselves in the perspective of especially young people growing up today, this will show us some cultural trends that I think are that are important. They're going to continue to be important. And if things go the way I, I expect them to go in the future, this will be the issue, the wedge issue that makes social justice not function anymore as a viable political ideology. Uh, I've been very influenced by the in, the ministry of Dr. James White. He's a Christian apologist who will interact with Muslims. He'll interact with other non-Christian groups. And he is fond of saying the American left contains within itself the seeds of its own destruction. And that's very much what this thought experiment is about. We, we see this every day. The, the old joke is SJWs always turn on each other. They always eat their own. And you can see evidence of that just by going online and looking at conversations. You will see people roasting or turning on anyone who is friendly to the American left, the Democrat Party, hardcore SJW politics based on them doing something really bad, like Joss Whedon cheating on his wife, or based on people doing really innocuous minor things like micro-aggressing or drawing a character too thin or too white and then the hordes will turn on you. So this is a example of that, but I think what's important about thinking about this is it's gonna give us perspective on why trans trending is a thing. If you aren't familiar with the term, trans trending is the idea of pretending to be trans solely for the purpose of getting some sort of benefit out of it or because you think it's cool and it makes you special, not because you sincerely believe you are the opposite gender or some other gender. So here's a question to start off this thought experiment. Why did trans rights become a very hot topic of discussion just within the past two or three years or so? I mean, it was always part of the acronym. LGBT, even before they added the Q and then the I and the A and the two S and the P's, uh, T, T was our, always part of that acronym for transgender or transsexual back then, depending on who was using it. But after Obergefell, the Supreme Court decision that legalized gay marriage across the country in all 50 of the United States, then I think tra the trans movement started to become more prominent because one, one victory had been won, uh, gay marriage was won, so gay marriage was the great issue, the great civil rights issue of our time a few years ago, and then once uh, victory was declared on the gay rights issue, then immediately the progressive left moved on to their next major issue, the T in LGBT. And you might start seeing gay characters portrayed as the villains in a sitcom because they weren't good trans allies. You started seeing a wild influx of trans characters in children's entertainment. One thing that prompted this is me picking picking up people at an elementary school and seeing a lot a, a very surprising number of young boys dressed in girls' clothes and seeing a library display with every trans children's book imaginable. I Am Jazz, Two Kings isn't a trans book, it's a gay, it's a gay marriage book, but also I think it's Harold and the Tangerine Dress. Pretty much they're all about a little boy who uh, discovers that he wants to be a little girl or at least wear dresses and do effeminate things. And sometimes this is 
subtextual like it's a little penguin who's a little boy penguin who's pink and he doesn't like being a pink penguin because pink's a girl's color and then he learns that it's okay for him to be a little pink penguin or it's more direct like it's literally about a little boy who decides he wants to dress in girls clothes and identify as a girl and this was a kind of highlighted celebrated feature on display at a children's elementary school pretty much i anticipate that the number of people who identify as trans is going to keep increasing. It's going to keep increasing until it gets ridiculous. So if, it, if you think maybe it's about 1% of the population right now of people who identify as trans, I wouldn't be surprised if it peaks at 90% of the male population identifying as trans, which is a bold prediction, right? That's like a really dramatic change. So here's why I think we will, we may possibly reach that point. So you're looking at a picture of a donkey and there's a stick whacking the donkey. It's a little sad, troubled donkey and it's looking ahead and it sees a carrot dangling from a string to illustrate the classic old saying, the carrot and the stick. Yeah, it's really easy to understand what this phrase means. Donkeys are stubborn animals. They don't like to move sometimes. And unlike a horse, a donkey will plant its feet and not move for you if it doesn't feel like moving. So what's the carrot and the stick for? Well, it's to encourage the donkey to do what you want it to do. You whack the donkey with the stick and you hold the carrot in front of the donkey. And both things motivate the donkey to move in the direction you want it to go. It doesn't like the stick, so it moves away from the stick. It wants the carrot, so it moves towards the carrot. Now, if I were to ask a advocate of social justice or trans rights about the carrot and the stick and ask them, what relevance do you think this has to talking about cultural pressure and the trans rights issue? What a lot of them might say is that, well, people who are cis-hetero in their, in their gender, people who identify as the gender they were born as biologically. So if you're born a boy, you identify as a boy. If you're born a girl, you identify as a girl. Your cis is the new term for that. They might say that because we live in a cis-heteronormative culture that privileges cisgendered people, all the social pressure would be for trans people to not identify as trans. And particularly if you're kind of in a conservative Christian area, that, that makes some sense, right? If you suddenly go to church dressed in a dress when you normally come dressed in a t-shirt and jeans, the pastor's going to take note of that. Your parents might take note of that. Uh, so there's definitely a way in which social pressure might discourage someone who wants to identify as the opposite gender from doing so. However, the point I'm trying to make is that there are also social pressures which could encourage this donkey to transition to the opposite donkey gender, even if there's no reality behind that. This could be a perfectly normal male donkey. He's happy being a male donkey, but the carrot and the stick is what encourages this donkey to transition to being a female burrow. Now, someone who uses privilege theory or intersectional feminism as their primary lens for looking at the world, what I've just said may not make a lot of sense. Why on earth would someone who is privileged give up that privilege? Why would someone willingly sacrifice all the benefits they get for being a straight, white, cis-heteronormative male and take on a marginalized gender? And frankly, I think someone who thinks that way must be living in a box to, to not be able to see what social advantages there would be for pretending to be the opposite gender and claiming a marginalized identity, even if there's no truth behind the claim. So what is the stick? The stick for this young male donkey is being told he's a straight, white, cishet male donkey by all the villagers. They whack him with the stick and they say, cishet, white, male donkey. And it hurts. It hurts his feelings. And no matter how much he brays and, you know, he haws, the, the villagers don't care. They keep whacking him with that stick. Straight, white, cishet, male donkey. And then he looks over and he sees the carrot. What's the carrot? Well, Carrot could be an opportunity to work at one of the major comic book companies who are celebrating how they hire trans creators and give them opportunities. It could be a scholarship that's only available 
to LGBTQ youth. And this donkey, you know, really doesn't want to go to debt at school. So a scholarship that that looks like a good option could be social acceptance, where the donkey looks around and sees tons of clubs and student opportunities for trans identifying students. And maybe this donkey feels lonely and isolated because of all of the straight, white, male, cishet donkey and the wax of the stick. So maybe that carrot looks more and more sumptuous. The life of a trans person looks more and more wonderful to this donkey. And this is really just sort of the, the, parting, the parting of the ways, I think, between social justice and everyone else. If you sincerely believe that to be trans is always to be marginalized and to be cishet is to always be privileged, it makes no sense to you why anyone would decide to identify as trans unless they really sincerely believe they were in their heart of hearts. It doesn't make sense why anyone would lie about their gender identity just for some kind of social benefit. But the fact that we can see examples of social benefits for being trans and having a marginalized identity in real life, in institutions, in major scholarships and job opportunities, that's the carrot. So as long as we understand that the carrot exists and the stick exists, that means the potential always exists for the donkey to get, to get motivated to move towards the carrot. Now, maybe someone who's an advocate of social justice would think, well, this is wonderful. This means that more young men are embracing their trans identity. What, what would be the problem with people living in accordance with their gender? But the point, whole point of this illustration is that the donkey is not really a trans donkey. This is a male donkey. This donkey is perfectly happy being a male donkey. Social pressure is being exerted to encourage this donkey to say it is something it is not where the donkey is being encouraged to pretend it's a donkey of the opposite gender. Now, why is the log here? Well, you know, the carrot and the stick, that's pretty straightforward. You know, uh, if you identify as trans, you could, I, you could gain access to these social benefits. You could escape from the social pressure of being a straight, white, privileged, cishet man. You can gain the social benefits of being a marginalized person and escaping the burden of privilege that's on your back. But just because you want to do that doesn't mean that you actually can do that or that it makes sense. So if there's a log between the donkey and the carrot, it doesn't matter how much we whack that donkey with the stick. It doesn't matter how delicious that carrot looks and how hungry the donkey is. If the donkey cannot jump over that log, there's no way it's going to get the carrot. There's a physical barrier between the donkey and the log. So what would keep someone from transitioning? Well, maybe the social pressures I mentioned earlier, if the donkey's a, a conservative Christian, that's going to be a major barrier. If the donkey isn't a conservative Christian, but just has family members who strongly believe that there are only two genders and that you should live as the gender you're born as, that's going to have some social pressure discouraging the donkey from pretending to be trans. Uh, and any number of things could just be a desire to live in accordance with what the do donkey believes is true. Like the do maybe the donkey thinks it might get rich pretending to be trans, but if it knows in its heart of hearts it's not a trans do donkey, it doesn't want to tell a lie. It doesn't want to live a lie. It wants to live its life truthfully. But now we're going to remove some logs. So first log, it's now easier to claim the identity of a trans person. So maybe 10 years ago, if you wanted to say you were trans, you'd probably be expected that if you were a man, you might dress up in women's clothing, you might wear a wig, you might actually undergo surgery to change parts of your body so that you look more like the opposite sex. It could be very expensive or at least very difficult to identify all the time as the opposite gender. Well, we're removing a log, we're making it easier. What makes it easier for someone to say they're trans? Gender fluidity, gender expression, all of these ideas about how gender is performed. So if someone believes that there are only two genders, they could be trans. They could be a very firm advocate of trans rights and say there are only two genders. If I'm a man and I want to identify as a woman, that means I am going to the opposite gender. If I'm a woman and I want to identify as a man, I'm going to the male gender. What complicates this is the 50 new genders and the gender spectrum. 
and the idea that your gender might be described by a completely foreign concept that typically doesn't have anything to do with gender or biological sex trigendered, spirit animaled, whatever may have you. So, you know, like maybe your gender actually is donkey. So once that happens, suddenly it's much easier to identify as trans. Here's one. Passing privilege removes a log for this donkey. What's passing privileged? Well, privilege goes on infinitely. There are, there, people are always going to be able to find new ways to create privileges and oppressed groups. So passing privilege is the privilege that a trans person has if they are convincingly able to identify as the opposite gender. So if a young man is able to pass as a young woman and you look at this person and you think, oh, that's a woman. You don't for a second think that this is a man dressed as a woman. That person has passing privilege. People who don't have passing privilege are the ones who aren't convincingly able to m mimic the opposite gender. So if you have a beard and big boobs, you don't have passing privilege because you don't conform to either of the cishet genders and the gender binary. So if the whole point is we're imagining this donkey trying to escape the burden of privilege, trying to escape the punishment and the ridicule and anger that this donkey gets for being a privileged cishet white male donkey. It's actually better if the donkey doesn't transition or undergo surgery. It, it's actually better if the donkey doesn't pass as a female donkey. So we'll look at the donkey and we'll say, well, boy, that looks like a male donkey to me. It has all the visual characteristics of a male donkey. But really, in all the donkey has to say is, in my heart of hearts, I identify as a female donkey. And that's it. We can't expect it to undergo any surgery. We can't expect it to dress up in a girly donkey dress. This must be a woman donkey because it says so. So, boy, we have made it so much easier for this donkey to transition, haven't we? Not only does the donkey not have to undergo a bunch of expensive surgery, not only does the donkey have to dress up in uncomfortable or unfamiliar clothes every day, the donkey actually gets more points. The donkey gets more carrot if he acts like a normal male donkey for all his life, but just says he's a female donkey because now he's not passing. He doesn't have the privilege of passing as the opposite gender. It's better for him if we can't identify his female gender by looking at him. So now that the log has been removed and all other logs have been removed, a lot of the social pressure has been removed. When I referred earlier to that elementary school that highly encourages kids to read books about trans rights and trans kids, that removes a log of social pressure from those kids' lives. Now, now it's kind of cool if you do that, and your parents who are progressive might encourage that. So all of these coolness factors are going to encourage more donkeys to move over to the carrot. And without those logs functioning as barriers, more and more young people who aren't really trans are going to adopt that identity. And as long as they gain social benefits from it, financial benefits from it, they're, they're going to be encouraged to continue doing that. Now, age, the age of the donkey, the age of the person doing this transition is really important here. So if someone in their 40s says, hey, I'm a girl all of a sudden, can I get some of that sweet, juicy carrot? There, there might be some suspicion. If you, they look on your Twitter or your Facebook and they see you posting, you know, Trump memes, they're, they're probably going to guess that you're just joking. You're pretending to have a trans identity as a way of winning an argument or having some fun. And they're going to be able to kind of gatekeep you and say, yeah, you're not really trans. But for the young person, it becomes easier and easier to pass as trans. Uh, if you were young and you were part of that environment and you had a you know brief period of time where you were a little boy who wore dresses, you might be able to produce photographs and say, well, see, and when I was in elementary school, I wore clothes like this. I, I have a long history of having this identity. If you weren't raised in an environment where there was either a strong religious objection or at least a strong cultural objection to being trans, then uh, there'd be no cu cultural or social pressures on you for making that move over to the carrot. So pretty much this sums up the thought experiment. More and more young people are going to identify that carrot. Less and less logs are going to keep them from jumping over and getting to the carrot. So naturally, more and more young people are going to move over and 
get access to that marginalized status. Now this might be the most contentious part of my whole thought experiment. Why would a young person identify as trans for financial benefit? We know some people do it. I think every trans person or every person on the left knows that it's possible for someone to identify as trans just for some sort of social benefit or financial benefit. But what makes me think that it's going to become a significant part of our culture, that trans trending is essentially going to go from being something that a few people do that we argue about to being something that a lot of young people do. And my only evidence for this would be anecdotal, and that's the experience of the so of interacting with the social justice left on college campuses, where as you interact with them, that's the reason I use the stick metaphor. The stick is whacking your rear end. They're saying cis, het, straight, white, male, whack, whack, whack. That's why I think it's mostly going to be young men identifying as young women. There, there may be some young women who identify as young men to get access to this marginalized status as well. But I think overwhelmingly, it's going to be young white men, straight white men, transitioning to female and not even doing that much to say they've transitioned. They might just they'll wake up, they still got their messy t-shirt and messy jeans on, and they go to school in their same messy t-shirt and jeans. They can be just as sloppy as they were when they identified as a cis male, but now they, they say they sincerely identify as a female. It's on their paperwork. It's how the school is identifying them. The reason that they're going to end up doing that is because it gives them access to the benefits of being a marginalized person instantly. And not only that, it gives them uh, significant cred. Uh, they, they move to a very high place in the oppression hierarchy. So if uh, someone gets in their face in a class debate and says, you only say that because you're white, well, now the new, the new trans young man, the, the young man who is now pretending to be a woman, just for perceived social benefits. Now that young man can say, ah, but you only say that because you're cis. But then the, the, the young black man, well, he could say, ah, you assume that I was cis. Well, I too, I also am trans. So I just see this as inevitably creating chaos. It's going to devolve into argument after argument after argument, and it's never going to let up. And it's going to create the civil war that I think would functionally destroy the American left as a cohesive political union. So you, you may be familiar with arguments online between TERFs and intersectional feminists. TERFs stands for trans-exclusive radical feminists, and intersectional feminists want to include trans rights in their big picture of what feminism should be. So if you're a feminist and you exclude trans women, men who identify as women, if you say that trans that men who identify as women aren't women, you're a bad feminist. You are holding back progress. You're a, you're a poor ally of feminism, and you're not really a feminist. So right now, I kind of perceive the TERFs as the minority and the intersectional feminists as the new majority. They're successfully tarring and feathering the old school 70s, 80s, trans-exclusive radical feminists and kicking them out of progressive spaces. And part of this, there's a little schadenfreude here. Uh, this, this is the kind of feminism like Judy Chicago mocking men in misandrist performance art pieces where she attaches you know, a giant male genitalia and female genitalia to actors. And then the lady pretending to be the man with the penis, she portrays this very angry and toxic man because that's what men are, right? So there was this assumption amongst old radical feminists that there was something bad about being a man and having a penis, and there was something inherently good about being a woman and having a vagina. The problem being that they assumed that having a vagina had something to do with being a woman and having a penis had something to do with being a man. Under the new intersectional feminism, those old radical feminists are deeply problematic. They're deeply cis-heteronormative. And I am just so happy to see that there's finally some com comeuppance for the years and years of open misandry and abuse and hatred of men from this radical group of feminists. It is joyful. Go watch my video on war, women art revolution, this radical femi feminist art documentary to get some more information on that little story. But right now, the intersectional feminists are kind of winning the fight 
with the TERFs. The no, no, very, very few people like what TERFs have to say. Very, very few people like trans-exclusive radical feminists. All right, but what's going to happen, though, when maybe 90% of young men start identifying as women purely to gain social benefits, purely to gain access to scholarship money and teaching positions and jobs? Well, what I think is going to happen is that cis women, normal young women who are maybe more moderate feminists, they're going to start noticing the number of young men coming into their spaces where their trans identity is the key the, that allows them to come into these female spaces. So you're working on your feminist essay that will get you your big scholarship and you're working really hard and here comes Joe. He doesn't even identify himself with a female name. He doesn't even wear any female clothing. He looks like a typical Joe Schmo dude, but he says he's trans. So he's also entering the essay contest and he gets to mention that not, o- not only is he trans, his gender identity is that of a nonconformist. So he doesn't conform to the female gender expression. He just identifies himself as female in in his heart of hearts. And he wins the essay contest. Well, that's very irritating. If you're a young woman who's been working hard and studying feminism very hard all your life, you're going to feel deprived. You're going to feel like men are coming into your spaces and taking stuff away from you that should be yours. And when you look at a lot of feminist literature, so much of it is concerned with power. So much of it is concerned with economics. So much of it is concerned with taking things away from the privileged people and giving it to the underprivileged people. So with all of this attention on the stuff we have, the money we have, the power that we have, I know that young women are going to notice when more and more young men come into their spaces and get access to this power. Now, at first, they're going to have to say, oh, well, we're inclusive of young trans men here. We're accepting of young trans trans men here. So they won't won't say anything. They'll celebrate it. They'll they'll go along with it. There's going to have to come, though, a sort of critical point where every young feminist is going to look up and look around and see themselves surrounded by dude bros surrounded by young men and say, wait a second, wait a second, how did all these young men start getting access to all of the, the amazing things that I'm supposed to have access to? And I think that's when we're going to start gradually seeing more and more infighting, where the turfs are going to look more and more sexy to young women who are afraid that men are coming for their privileges. And pretty, mu- pretty much uh, it, it would... I, I've said I've said what I wanted to say. It's going to keep devolving and keep going nuts. So, I think that's the point. Uh, I think I've made the point that there are really strong social pressures that would encourage this to start happening. And if you have thoughts on this thought experiment, let me know in the comment section. But I really do think that uh, it's gonna it's just going to be hard to be a leftist on campus. It's already hard to be anyone on American campuses the, these days. But as this becomes more and more of a thing that people start noticing, I think it's going to become more and more heated. And I don't see how intersectional feminism provides a way out of this little dilemma. And they're not, they're not going to be prepared for it because, because in their mindset, this young cishet white male is privileged. It's going to be hard for them to accept the possibility that large numbers of young men actually would like to identify as young women to escape the responsibilities and expectations of being a man and gain some of the social benefits of being a woman. And it'll it'll be fun. I just think it's going to be fun. So we'll come back to this video maybe in a few years. In a few short years, I'll come back and revisit this video and check in to see if the coming SJW apocalypse has happened yet. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. If you like this video, why don't you like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll catch you later.